because our fathers were actively anti-communist. Their lives were in danger. When the white Russians in Shanghai learned about this attack from the north, they panicked and then they said, we have to escape. So through the International Refugee Organization, IRO, they wrote to so many countries, but only the Philippines responded. It was only during the time of President Quirino. Hello, I'm Ai Makaraig. Welcome to Rappler Talk. Giwan Eastern Samor hit global headlines in 2013 because of Super Typhoon Yolanda or Haiyan. But back in 1949, it was also the focus of international attention as the Philippines became the only country to open its doors to so-called white Russian refugees fleeing the Chinese Communist Army. What explains the country's strong humanitarian tradition of welcoming refugees? Joining us are Bernard Kerblat, UN High Commissioner for, Ref for Refugees, or UNHCR, representative in the Philippines, and Kina Kwan, senior researcher from the Carino Foundation. Welcome to Rappler. So not a lot of Filipinos actually know this story, that there were white Russian refugees who were, housed, who were hosted in Giwan. So can you tell us what exactly was the story? How did they come to the Philippines? Oh, um, <clears throat> so the, the white Russians who were in Tubaba were actually part of one of the biggest diasporas in the 20th century. So that's, that was the, the Russian diaspora. And it started in 1917 during the Bolshevik Revolution. So, <clears throat> so white Russians were the people who opposed the Reds or the communists. Mm -hmm. So when the Reds took over Russia, they had to flee, of course. And then the, because of geography, a lot of them went to China. And then um, they settled in Shanghai because that was the international community back then. And then, um, so when they heard again that communists was about to, the communists were about to, um, uh, to take over uh, China in 1948, they wanted to flee. And they sent circular letters to all the free countries in the world, including US, Australia, mm -hmm. uh, South America, but only the Philippines. Um, gave them a, a, a haven, a temporary the, the asylum. The whole world, not the whole just in world. Asia. Yes, mm -hmm. the whole world. And I, we actually don't know yet uh, why that was, but we have uh, like a few um, theories. theories yes. Okay. And so in 1949, they arrived in Tubabao Island. Mm -hmm. So President Elpidio Quirino um, provided the island of Tubabao in Giwan Eastern Samar for the refugee camp. And then um, in what, why that was, because Tubabao became one of the receiving stations okay. for the U.S. naval base, which was, which was built in Giwan in, during World War II. Mm -hmm. And then so they were there for uh, three years, from 1949 to 1951. Three years? It's pretty long. So Bernard, Kina mentioned there are several theories as to why the Philippines was the only country who was willing to take in the white Russians. Wh what's your theory? Why do you think? Well, magandang umaga po. Magandang umaga. <laughs> I don't have a, a theory. However, uh, what, I, what we take note of is the following. First, we have to remember 1949, this beautiful country is a very young, nascent, right. a sovereign mm -hmm. republic. Uh, number two, as very often the case in a refugee crisis, as Kina eloquently explained, these people were geographically located in Shanghai and they were regrouping as the Red Army was marching throughout China. And they issued a call for help. And what is remarkable is in the concert of nations, this young, independent, sovereign republic confronted with huge challenges, right. busy with reconstruction from mm -hmm. the uh, destruction of the uh, inherited from the Second World War, mm -hmm. extremely busy pulling together their institutions, passing laws, building up the administration and so on. And yet, what I would like the world to know, starting with our Kababayan, is that the only country which had the political courage mm -hmm. to raise their hands and say, we the Philippines, we care, and we are ready to admit you mm -hmm. in our country, despite the long list of issues 
we're confronted to. And I'd like to recall that very recently in the context of the Rohingya crisis, yes, yes. I've heard a lot of arguments, oh, Kawanaman, we are a poor nation, we right. have a lot of domestic issues. Yes. And true. However, let's recall what our ancestors did in 1949. The issues were, I would say, tenfold, mm -hmm. fifteenfold, I don't know. And yet, out of compassion, the Philippines came forward and put on the table a very simple yet generous offer of hospitality and say, come over. Mm -hmm. And what is important to note is that I don't think the Philippines care about who these people were, what did they think. Did they they registered from? the fact that they were in danger mm -hmm. and they were fleeing potential persecution. And President Quirino took the decision and said, okay, uh, we open our borders to, to them. Now, come to think of the reality of today and uh, if President Quirino, bless his soul, were to come back today, <laughs> imagine the landscape he would find today, not only in the Philippines, globally, globally mm -hmm. in the world. I think President Quirino would be shocked, dismayed, by various reflexes of um, xenophobia, mm -hmm. various reflexes of intolerance, where refugees are very often unwelcome <coughs> around the world. And I'm thinking right now, this morning, mm -hmm. about what's happening in some very remote Greek islands in the Mediterranean. I'm thinking about what is happening in Lampedusa, mm -hmm. off the coast of Sicily. I'm thinking about um, what's happening in, in the more generous, hospital, hospitable uh, societies around Syria, Turkey. Turkey, yes. 1.6 million refugees in Turkey today. Um, you know, a few days ago, we were invited and the, um, the Turkish Navy ship, in fact, as a matter of coincidence, it was the same ship which at the beginning of the Rohingya crisis was dispatched was deployed. Wow, okay. to participate in, in search and rescue operation. Mm -hmm. And we took this opportunity to express in a very humble way our gratitude to the Turkish authorities, to the Turkish government. Um, and in a few hours, the High Commissioner for Refugees will also be meeting the Prime Minister of Turkey. Okay. Because Turkey, uh, this year, this morning, as we speak, has the sad privilege of being the number one country in the world which hosts the highest number of refugees, 1.6 million refugees. Mm -hmm. Now, going back to Giwan, mm -hmm. what is remarkable is that 70 years ago, as you rightly pointed out, um, this very traditional micro society of Giwan opened their arms, welcomed these foreigners white Russians who came through an incredible odyssey by ship mm -hmm. all the way from Shanghai through three, at least that we know, three trips, um, by, by uh, three rotations by uh, r rusty cargo vessels, um, disembark in uh, uh, Tubabao Island. And by the way, I would like to encourage our Kababayan to go and visit Giwan. Okay because there's still traces there visible in Giwan. Of the refugees. Who yeah, 70 yeah. years ago welcomed refugees. Okay. And let me conclude by saying that 70 years later, when this uh, atrocious typhoon, Yolanda stroke, yes. Giwan was ground zero in the sense that this is, was the entry point into the territory of the Philippines yes. of that typhoon. The first landfall. Correct. Yeah. And 70 years later, the same communities who had welcomed victims of forced, uh, forced displacement were themselves Refugee. the victims of forced displacement on account of a natural disaster of mm -hmm. a gigantic proportion. <clears throat> so it was natural that the international community, and not only UNHCR, but many organizations, um, flew to also Giwan and <laughs> say to Giwan, Giwan, this is payback time. Mm -hmm. uh, this is now that we would like, in a very humble way, extend our solidarity, our compassion, 
and rolling up our sleeves in supporting you to recover from this forced displacement imposed on you by uh, Yolanda. Mm -hmm. So talking about G1, the Quirino Foundation um, got a lot of never-before-seen footage and photos of the white Russian refugees who were actually there. So in the course of your research, well, first, how did you start uh, going about okay, this research? Uh, and wh what were the things that you learned in the process? Okay, how did I start? Well, I actually live in G1. I was born and raised there. And growing up, I've heard of uh, the white Russian story, naturally, from, from my parents and my grandparents. And then when I was in college, uh, I took up humanities and I, was, I had to do a research paper in history. And then, timely, because my mom was doing a research on white Russians back then, 2005, okay. she started tracking them down. My mom was a former mayor. Mm -hmm. And then she started tracking them down, a lot of them replied. And then I asked my mom, um, uh, why, are we, are, why are we interested in this? And she said, well, you know how I dance ballet? My mom, she dances ballet. Okay. And all her siblings can can play the piano, mm -hmm. and I was wondering why in a, such a small town of Giwan, people can dance ballet and play piano. The arts. The arts, exactly. Mm -hmm. And so she said it was because of the white Russians. They taught. They taught. The they taught the of people Giwan. of Giwan for it was a, a mean a means to to get more income, I guess, because mm -hmm. they didn't have money. Mm -hmm. So they taught these arts to the local people. And you actually have a photo of yes. the white Russians yes. Yes. after a performance, I, I suppose. Yeah. Yes. And then, so um, my take, my research is actually very personal. Mm -hmm. I record uh, human stories rather than uh, the, the, the traditional history when you, when you just take in facts. Mm -hmm. So I do oral history, I interview them, I ask about their experiences. And then um, the and greatest what did they discovery. Tell you? What did they the tell greatest you? discovery, I think, uh, the, the greatest human stories um, that they told me was how, basically, how meaningful the experience was for them. Mm -hmm. It was just two years. I mean, Shanghai was longer, but um, to Baba, to them was, according to one person, uh, was the most traumatic, but the most meaningful to them. And a lot of them said that it was kind of a breather. Okay. Because a lot of the, it was like, um, it was a, a very tiring uh, experience mm -hmm. from Russia to China to the, Philippines. to the Philippines. And then the Philippines, it was paradise. It was a beach. Mm -hmm. It was, there was sunset. And they didn't have to work much because mm -hmm. they were taken care of by IRO, the International Refugee Organization, which mm -hmm. is the predecessor of UNHCR. UNHCR. Mm -hmm. And then, so it was a, a moment for them to like, take it all in, what was happening to them, what, what's going to happen, um, and I guess I'll have hope of what's mm -hmm. about to come. Mm -hmm. And then I also found a lot of pictures and videos, and oh, I'm not sure if we have them, but yeah. Yeah, we have. <laughs> so aside, yeah, go, uh, go ahead, Bernard. See, what is important here, she said something very, very important. Mm -hmm. The message, number one, is the following. Refugees are human beings like you, like yes, you, like me. Right. Dancing, ballet. <laughs> but they bring with them skills. Yes. They have a past. They have knowledge. They have experiences. And in the case of Giwan, what I find extraordinary mm -hmm. is that 70 years later, we still remember the skills that they brought with them and they are shared with the local communities, which explains the reason why in Giwan today, as you walk through the town, which is undergoing huge reconstruction, mm -hmm. you can still hear a piano. You can still witness during the fiesta, uh, 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 ladies who are dancing uh, ballet. Mm -hmm. This is extraordinary. That's the first message. Second message, when President Quirino took this very principal courageous decision. Did he know that among them there were world-class music composers, mm, right. ballet dancers, right. skillful people and so on? No. No. He didn't know. He knew that there were human beings who, by the way, were refugees for the second time in their life, That's having right. fled mm -hmm. from Russia. the 1917 uh, Bolshevik Revolution and having s resumed a new life in China were for the second time in their life forced to flee uh, uh, the second place of mm -hmm. uh, residence. And the last point, because Kitty Wise is too modest to mention <laughs> it. Okay. She's the 
niece mm -hmm. of the mayor, mayor, no. uh, mayor Shin Gonzalez. And I'd like to take this opportunity to pay respect and bow with appreciation and admiration. I remember Mayor Shin Gonzalez in the very few hours after the disaster, as his own family was under threat because of the disaster. He nonetheless took the decision to lead his community, pull them together, and organize and put in place the first measure in terms of saving lives and pushing back mortality in the very few hours following uh, uh, Yolanda. Mm -hmm. And it is thanks to these kind of leaders, you know, like communities like Giwan were able to lick their wounds and, and move forward towards the path of reconstruction. And I'd like to pay respect because in my eyes, I have been in disasters in situation of uh, mass force displacement for 35 years. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I could safely say that if there were more leaders like Mayor Shin Gonzalez, I could tell you that uh, refugees, internally displaced persons, asylum seekers around the world mm -hmm. would be in much better shape. So I also wanted to sort of share this point with our mm. viewers. Bernard, earlier you related um, the G1 experience to the present now, the Rohingya crisis, and the Philippines um, saying it is open, it is opening its doors. What do you think are the best practices that the Philippines can offer from, say, from the white Russian refugee experience or from other experiences in the past of hosting refugees that we can now present to countries in ASEAN in dealing with this crisis? Well, thank you very much. A very good question indeed. Um, first, as you rightly pointed out, the welcoming of the white Russians from 1949 to 1953 on Philippine territory was an incredible um, odyssey spearheaded by the great leader that President Quirino was. Mm -hmm. But President Quirino himself looked at another model which took place just before the Second World War when President Quezon opened the shore of the Philippines to people who were escaping the rise of Nazism in Austria, in Germany, mm -hmm. in Russia, in Poland, and elsewhere, and allowed uh, and granted humanitarian visa to admit people um, uh, Jewish of various nationalities who were clearly on the path of being exterminated. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is also a, an episode of Philippine history which I think remains to be documented yes, yes. and to be shared with the children of this beautiful country. And before that there was another group of people who were escaping persecutions and uh, Spanish Republicans not in the highest bracket of income mm -hmm who squeezed money to pay their passage in third class, sometimes sleeping on the deck of the vessel, trying to flee from the Mediterranean into, after the, uh, the rise of the Frankism uh, in Spain, uh, and came to uh, look for a asylum here, fleeing from persecution. So, going back to your question, what I think is important is when the world looks at what the Philippines has done throughout its history in welcoming groups or individuals who are in need of persecutions and who arrive, be it in Tubabao or Manila uh, mm. Harbor Palawan. or Palawan mm. for the uh, uh, Vietnamese yes, or Bataan, or Bataan mm. for the Indochinese mm. refugees. Or later in 2000 when the uh, East Timorese were uh, exercising their right to self-determination and some 600 of them also were in need of temporary protection, the Philippines has a clearly established history based on compassion, mm -hmm. based on humanitarian deeds. And you know, when the Philippines as a society makes this kind of decision, it is completely outside of politics. It is simply by putting this humanitarian act on the table saying, okay, people in need of sanctuary mm -hmm. and asylum, you're welcome. Like 
the Giwan communities have done 70 years ago under the leadership of President Quirino. Now, today, next to uh, our door, an hour and a half, two hours away mm -hmm. by flight, there is another crisis unfolding, which involves five countries, Myanmar, Bangladesh, Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia. Mm -hmm. And that crisis has disappeared, thanks God, mm -hmm. from the media. But that crisis is not yet solved. But there is a solution underway, and it's a very complex, multifaceted crisis. And the solution of that crisis doesn't lie with one state only, but through the combination of pulling together, thinking, and putting together around the table the solution. Mm -hmm. Now, the Philippines have played a very important role in simply restating the basic principles that the Philippines were ready to uphold the right to asylum in the event that these people will reach the shore of the Philippines. These people, which is a mixed group of uh, stranded migrants and people in need of international protections, and both of these groups have the common denominator of being victims of human smuggling. These people, they need first and foremost compassion. Mm -hmm. Two, they need to be recognized that they exist as human beings, equal to you, to you, mm -hmm. to me, with the same needs. They need food, they need shelter, they need dignity, they need rights. Third, we have seen a reversal of the crisis in the sense that boats are now allowed to disembark. And I'm happy to report that for the past two weeks there has been no um, arrival of new boats, mm -hmm. which means that the human smugglers' um, networks have been severely uh, degraded mm -hmm. by combined reaction from Myanmar, Bangladesh, Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia. So that's the first step. Second, these human beings have been allowed to disembark. Third, solution, a framework of, for solution is underway and the subject of ongoing consultation. It is important to distinguish who is a person in need of international protection, who is a migrant in search of um, uh, better economic uh, opportunities. Mm -hmm. And it is also important to recognize the root causes which needs to be tackled. Right, in and the countries themselves. In the mm -hmm. countries of origin, correct. So that debate is underway. The search for solution and the collective pulling together of expertise, perspective and so on is underway. And certainly Philippines has a lot to contribute to the debate, having a wealth of expertise, the Philippines is the only signatory to the 1951 Convention on Refugee Status and the 1954 Convention of Statelessness in the region. And by virtue of having ratified these two conventions, the Philippines has developed over the years a wealth of expertise in assessing refugee status determination, individual claim. That's one. Second, they have also a, a developed an expertise when it comes to resolving, preventing uh, statelessness mm -hmm. and there is right now a very promising joint endeavor between Indonesia and the Philippines in looking at the status of some 11,000 people of uh, uh, Indonesian descent located in Sarangani and it's a collaborative effort between Indonesia and Philippines mm -hmm. so all of these best practices that Philippines have developed I'm reassured when I hear Secretary De Lima yes, yes. Secretary Coloma yeah. to say we, the Philippines, in a simple, unassuming way, are prepared to share our expertise. And it's not a question of finger pointing. Mm -hmm. It is not a question of imposing viewpoint. It is a question of contributing to this concert of nation to look at is what are the best solutions in order to solve that crisis. And for that, Maraming Salamatpo to the Philippines, the Philippines public opinion, the, you know, we've taken note of very powerful messages mm -hmm. issued by the Bishop uh, Conference. Yes. We've CBC taken out of very powerful messages issued by uh, <coughs> regional, regional uh, Governor Mujiba Tamat. Yes. We've taken out of a countless number of uh, messages isu issued on social media, and it transcends political creed, faith, and geographic origin. It came from all the way from Luzon down to uh, Mindanao, 
and the nation, mm -hmm. the, the society at large, expressed its compassion and its desire to contribute. Mm -hmm. So very often I'm asked the question, what can we do to help refugees? Yes. Given the fact that today in this world, if you consider that one person out of every 122 is either a refugee or an internally displaced person or an asylum seeker, my answer is very simple. Starts with a handshake, starts with a smile, starts with compassion, and start by not being afraid because you don't know this person. And by nature, mm -hmm. refugees come from uh, different uh, uh, backgrounds, different horizons, different countries, different cultures, and, but they are human beings like you, like you, like me. And a, an extended hand, a glass of water on the way to Greece or <laughs> to this tragedy in uh, uh, Lampedusa, mm -hmm. you know, is what the local people in Greece are offering today. Mm -hmm. uh, a smile, an understanding, but please, let's not withdraw in these reflexes of xenophobia, mm -hmm. fear, rejection. No. Uh, we need to um, be compassionate as the Philippines. And I have only one wish. My wish this morning is that this Pinoy sense of Bayanian, mm -hmm. which is deeply entrenched in your culture, in your yeah. genes. We talked earlier about what happened 70 years ago in Guiwan. It continues today. That Pinoy spirit of Bayanian may it become an infectious disease which spreads all around the planet, contaminate and overcome xenophobia to convince human beings that they should face the fact that one out of 122 persons in today's world is a victim of forced displacement. And the Philippines are a beacon of hope in this region, but I dare to say also in the world. Mm -hmm. So you, you mentioned the world. So on June 20th, we're commemorating World Refugee Day. So what the Kina do you think, what do you think Filipinos should realize about this tradition, history we have, that it, it's actually a source of pride? And Bernard, if you could talk about the global picture also of what refugees are facing in the past year and currently as well. So let's start with Kina. Um. Well, um, can we start with her? Right okay. Now? I'm so sorry. The big picture. Yes, globally. You know, 2014 was definitely not a good year for UNITCR. Don't forget, all of us in UNITCR were striving to walk ourselves from the job. Mm -hmm. And I will be happy when the day when our services would no longer be needed. 2014, 59.5 million people in the world are recorded to be victim of forced displacements. 59.5 million, which means if these 59.5 million people were a country, that would be the 24th most populated country in the world. Mm -hmm. And so today we commemorate Refugee Day and it is for us a very humble occasion to speak on their behalf. These people have no voice, these people have no government to represent them, these people have no representation, but these people exist and they are here and they are fixing your bed in the hotel where you stay. Mm -hmm. They are sweeping the floor in the streets. They are carrying your luggage. They are also bringing, as we were remembered, incredible skills. Mm -hmm. But let's also remember this beautiful country is headed by the great president, Pinoy, mm -hmm. who once in his lifetime was also a victim of persecution and was a refugee benefiting from international pro uh, um, protection as prescribed in the 1951 convention in another country. <coughs> the point here is that refugees are representing 
all spectrum of society. They are human beings. And first and foremost, what they need is to have their rights as a human being respected. And for that, there is no substitute to the 1951 Convention, which mm -hmm. calls upon member states to extend international protection to people in need of it. It's a bit, if you want, you know, like the Coast Guards. You know, when they patrol the shores of this beautiful country and they see a vessels in distress, do they ask the question, who are you? Where do you come from? What do you carry on your ship? No. They say, oh, see game. You have a problem? No problem. We'll tow you. No? This, is, this, is the, this is the idea. And the Philippines is a clear <coughs> example of that. The Philippines exemplifies the notion of granting asylum to people who are in need of a sanctuary. And let's not, remember, let's not forget, not so long ago, during the darkest period of the history of this beautiful country, the Philippines used to be a refugee producing country. Mm -hmm. And there were people fleeing the Philippines, escaping from persecution. And now the Philippines have become a heaven to people in need of international protection. So that is what is important. You know, think, what do you think Filipinos should realize that they don't really know about And I this? think, um, given what Sir Bernard said, um, I think the public should know more about it. Like, mm -hmm. not a lot of people remember about, even in Giwa, not a lot of people remember. And I think we should understand what it means to be a refugee, but more so what it means to be a haven. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what it means to be, um, for a president to take in people from other countries, uh, people endangered. Mm -hmm. And so that, you know, we have this, some sort of pride that we, we did this. Mm -hmm. and, and I think one of the best things should be education, which is Sir Bernard's advocacy, to let people know about uh, our history of mm -hmm. being um, an asylum. I think. If I may, I have a wet dream for the Philippines, mm -hmm. this beautiful <laughs> country. You've got a very solid, strong education system. My message to Brother Armin this morning, <laughs> if he listens to us, would it be possible to include two hours, two hours in the curriculum at whatever grade? Doesn't matter. It's up to the education specialist to determine this. Two hours to teach the children of these beautiful countries, what their ancestors have done mm -hmm. by posing act of granting asylum. From President Quir Quirino, Quezon. President mm -hmm. Quezon, you know, the Spanish Republican, the Jewish refugees, the white Russians, the East Timorese in need of international protection, the Iranian revolution, uh, who during the 1979, in this country, there were some 14,000 Iranian students, basically. And when the change of regime occurred in the country of origin, they raised their hands and they asked the permission to be considered under a special type of visa by the government of the Philippines, which was granted to them. The Indo-Chinese Odyssey, 400,000 men, women, children, babies, elderly, were allowed, thanks to the Philippines, with the support of the international community, to resume a new life by benefiting from a transit and asylum in the Philippines. I mean, those are huge humanitarian endeavors and achievements mm -hmm. that our ancestors have done. And my very humble wish is that this is transmitted to the children who represent the future of this beautiful nation. And so that this is not uh, forgotten right, in the right. dark corner of history but that is kept present in the mind. You know, the children of today are the decision makers of tomorrow. <laughs> and if we want to perpetuate this tradition of asylum and humanitarian, which is ingrained in not only the text of the Republic of the Philippines, but also in the heart and minds of our Kababayan, this is inherent to your culture, uh, perhaps due to the fact that you are an island nation. Mm -hmm. um, but that, you know, when we talk in very serious terms with lawyers and so on about right to asylum and so on, let's start with the basics. And the basics have been developed here in the Philippines. 
in Guiwan mm -hmm. 70 years ago through act posed by President Quirino. Come to think about it. Mm -hmm. Where else in the world do you find a nation which is barely, say, four years old, confronted with a huge challenge of reconstruction, challenges of setting up institutions, passing laws, developing its administration, and yet being the only nation to answer the call of the international community to say, well, we've got this group of people here who are in need of a safe haven. That was the passionate answer, spontaneous, from President Quirino, encompassing the entire Philippine society, and it happened in Giwan, in Tubabao. And, and I encourage the <laughs> Filipinos to go discover Giwan. First of all, discover how brave these people are to have to roll up their sleeves and recover from the monstrous Yolanda uh, typhoons, barely, not even two years ago. And second, to look also at traces of history, visit the uh, cemetery with um, Orthodox crosses, uh, Star of David stars over some of the graves who were of uh, Jewish descent. They names in Cyrillic inscription, the ruins of the uh, camps, um, the tarmac of the airport, which was also used for uh, DC-6 um, planes to uh, help people, uh, refugees, to resettle to Australia. All of this, it's part of Giwan history. And you've got with us this morning this <laughs> wonderful representative from this community, you know, who has embarked on this very important research and made this research conducted together with the support of the Quirino Foundation be spread around, uh, be shared with the Philippines at large. Let me just add something. Mm -hmm. I think we also have to realize that these refugees, former refugees, they remember. They remember what they do, did for them. Mm -hmm. And based on my interviews, they were very thankful. And even today, they, they're not refugees anymore, but they, they, their children know about it. They, they're very thankful. They remember. So I think on Refu World Refugee Day, um, it's a, maybe uh, an event where, where former refugees could actually um, be thankful for um, how their lives um, turned out. They turned out well. And it's definitely something to be proud of. Thank you very much. That's our conversation on the Philippines as a safe haven for refugees with Bernard Kerblock, UNHCR country representative, and Kina Kwan of the Quirino Foundation. I'm Ayi Makraig. Thank you for joining us. were actively anti-communist, their lives were in danger. When the white Russians in Shanghai learned about this attack from the north, they panicked and then they said, we have to escape. So through the International Refugee Organization, IRO, they wrote to so many countries, but only the Philippines responded. It was only during the time of President Kirin. other countries would like to accept them, it's because there were so many of them, 5,500 or 6,000. But you could just imagine how great President Quirino is. He basically had the makings of a real Filipino, like very welcoming, the hospitality, noble, and he was a statesman. He, he went around the world and he was uh, creating international relations with countries. Shanghai with mom on the 26th of February in 49. The ship probably about six days or so. None of us knew where would we end up and what our life would be. And that was the start of the sojourn to Baba Island. 
and the first arrivals happened during the first month of 1949. When they arrived there, it was very primitive. It was a jungle. They cleared the area for tents. They dug holes for toilets. We were happy that we were safe. This was the safety that was most important and the optimism that basically things will get better. President Elpidio Quirino visited them by October 1949. It was President Quirino and according to them, his daughter Having the opportunity to go to the Philippines or being accepted into to being there, we are grateful to the people, to the government for, for letting us. Senator Nolan arrived at the camp in November of 1949 and he gave promises that people can actually enter the United States of America through the Displaced Persons Bill. There is one thing that they also experienced in Giwa, a very big typhoon. The name of the typhoon was Typhoon Ami. They had to be relocated. So at first they were sent to Tacloban City, but they were sent back to Giwa. So they had to rebuild again. Some of them got sick after the typhoon, but they had no choice. They had to be there and they had to survive. And that's how resilient they are. You notice that even if they had to go through that difficulty, you know that it created something beautiful in them. They are still thankful and grateful because they are alive. Towards the end, some of them migrated to South America, including Argentina, Paraguay. Those who were sick and the elderly went to France. And the able-bodied men went to Sydney. And then by 1950, the amendments to the bill was finally passed. So by 1951, Nolan's promise finally materialized. And finally, the people were able to live their new life in the United States of America. I think of Tugabao a lot, especially those who were teenagers then, have a very special place in their hearts for Tugabao. Even if they were young at that time, they understood what it meant for someone like President Kino to save their lives. So they tell it to their children and their children's children. And even to this day, they are very, very grateful. He was a savior for them, a hero for them.